As I've mentioned previously, the origins of the modern world begin in China, and by 1500, under the Ming Dynasty, population and culture and technology was flourishing, and Confucian-trained government officials were administering the empire. However, after tremendous successes, including the voyages of Zhang He, corruption and misrule began to creep into the Ming Empire by the next century allowing the armies of the Manchu from north of the Great Wall to install a new dynasty, the Qing, or Pure. The new Qing emperors reinvigorated the Confucian ruling class, and China once again enjoyed a degree of social stability and economic prosperity and international trade. However, Qing society rested on the laurels of previous accomplishments, and they regarded foreigners as ignorant barbarians, and they were not at all receptive to expanding European influence in the region, which was led by the British. By the mid-1700s, the British East India Company dominated trade and the administration of India. British ships carried Indian cloth and other products to the rest of the world. The tea dumped in Boston Harbor in 1773 came from India. The East India Company was very interested in opening up Chinese markets to trade. But China was self-sufficient and was not at all interested in anything that Britain had to offer. Chinese teas and jade and silks and porcelain were in high demand in the West, but the only payment that China was willing to take was silver. For centuries, the silver of the New World had been making its way into the Chinese economy, where it became the money supply of the world's largest economy. The East India Company's supply of silver was very limited. Luckily, India provided the company with an alternative, opium from poppies harvested in India and Burma. Although the Qing had outlawed opium imports in 1729, the East India Company controlled a virtually unlimited supply. At the beginning of the 19th century, an annual average of about 4,500 trunks of opium were reaching smugglers on the South China coast. The company focused on importing opium into China, where addicts were willing to pay in silver. By 1839, over 40,133 pound chests of opium were being bought by Chinese drug dealers. More than 1% of China's 400 million people became addicted, many of them rich bureaucrats. China rapidly shifted from being a magnet for silver with a huge trade surplus to becoming a net importer whose treasuries were rapidly dwindling. Some Chinese officials wanted to legalize opium so that the empire could tax it. But the Confucians, who were moralists, won the policy debate. In 1839, the emperor sent one of China's most distinguished officials, Lin Tseisu, to the trading settlement of Canton to stamp out the opium trade. Lin blockaded the European trading district, raided and searched the foreigners' warehouses, and confiscated 20,000 chests containing 1,200 tons of opium and dumped it all into the ocean. The East India Company complained about its losses in London, and Queen Victoria sent a fleet, including four steam-powered battleships. Lightly armored Chinese war junks, which were designed to fight river pirates, were severely outgunned. The limited range of Qing cannon compared to British artillery allowed the invaders to pummel the Chinese defenses from a safe distance. The Treaty of Nanjing, which was called the Unequal Treaty by the Chinese, opened five Chinese ports to European traders, gave the British the island of Hong Kong, and required China to establish diplomatic relations with Great Britain as an equal power, rather than continuing to treat all foreigners as barbarians unworthy of official notice. The Chinese were also compelled to pay Britain for all the opium that Lin had destroyed. China's embarrassing defeat by the British was followed by another defeat in the Second Opium War from 1856 to 1860 that resulted in another unequal treaty, giving access to the French and to Russian merchants. By the 1890s, 90 ports of call were available to more than 300,000 European and American traders and diplomats and missionaries. So, some questions for discussion. Were the British justified in their response to China's demand for silver in payment of their manufacturers? And then secondly, what was the social impact of opium addiction on China?